Hi, welcome to the video ministry here at First Baptist Church of Lamar. I'm Pastor Darian, and once again, I'm so glad that you are joining us. We're working our way through the Beatitudes, the beginning of Jesus's message on the Sermon of the Mount. This is the second video in that series. Last week, we looked at blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And today we look at the second one, which is blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. To give us the context of the whole passage, Joe, let me read to you Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3, and we will be reading through verse 12. This is what the word of the Lord says. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kind of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you so intently impressed on your greatness, your goodness, your holiness, and your patience. I don't think any of us have a clue as to just how much we mess this world up with sin. How far we strayed from the path that you had intended for humanity. And yet, Instead of wiping us off this planet, instead of punishing us for eternity, you sent Jesus to die on the cross to become our sin so that we might become your righteousness. Thank you for the gifts that you have given us in both grace and mercy. At the same time, though, there are still consequences of sin that we deal with here day to day and moment by moment. And some of those losses and some of those consequences hurt profoundly and deeply beyond what words can put in our hearts and our mouths. Thank you for being a God in those moments and in those places. Thank you for being a God who cares about us, who walks with us, who, who is the great comforter the one that we can go to in our time of need and find the grace and mercy we need to get through that moment. Today, we look at a passage that doesn't oftentimes get talked about because, well, it's, it's not comfortable. Mourning, grieving, those are awkward places. And so oftentimes we have not talked about it because of that and because we really honestly just want to try to pretend that those places don't exist. Thank you for being faithful, even when we're faithless. Thank you for your mercies that renew each and every morning, even when we get up and our heart still hurts. I pray that as we explore this verse, that you will help us to find ways to make the joy of you be our strength on the high points and the low points, on the mountaintops and the valleys. And draw us closer to you with every breath we take. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to share a statistic with you this morning before we get started here. This is a statistic that is absolutely true. There is no margin of error to this particular statistic. This is it. Every single person is going to mourn. Every single person is going to grieve. Now, what am I talking about here? Well, 
To mourn means to experience a loss. It, it's that sense that something that is important to us is no longer there. And it's that grieving, that sadness, that brokenheartedness that comes about as the result of that loss. Everyone is going to go through it. Everyone is going to experience it. I mean, in all honesty, there's only been two people in recorded history who did not die. Enoch and Elijah both ended up walking with God and they didn't die. Everyone else has died. Everyone else is going to die. Even God's own son died. And even Enoch and Elijah had loved ones that died. And so even they experienced mourning. It is something that all of us are going to experience. If it's so common, though, why don't we talk about it? I mean, really, honestly, we have done a very good job of trying to pretend that mourning and grieving doesn't exist. Hollywood is a great example of this. You watch a TV show, you watch a movie, and there's some kind of loss. Somebody loses a, a loved one, somebody loses their job. And one of two things happens when loss appears on our TV screen or on the big screen. Either the loss happens and then within five minutes, the credits roll, right? Because we don't want to stay there too long. Or within five minutes or the next two commercial breaks, everything is fixed. Everything's okay. Everything is back to the way it's supposed to be. I think only in country music do you hear a whole song, and through this song you lost your girl, you lost your dog, you lost your truck, you lost your job, and the only way to get those things back is to play the song backwards, or at least how, that's how the joke went in the 80s. Hallmark is famous for its total ignorance of the length of loss. You watch Hallmark movies and, you know, there's somebody that dies in the beginning and by the end, everything's okay. Only in Hallmark movies can somebody lose a spouse to, to cancer and, and deal with that and then by the end of the show, end up marrying a prince. It doesn't happen. Well, it happens on Hallmark movies, but it doesn't happen in real life. Why don't we talk about this more? I think it's it's kind of poignant to me that when Jesus sits everybody down, this is his second breath worth of words. This is his second sentence. This is so important to him that he's going to address this right up top. Well, I've kind of alluded to what we're talking about, but let's define some of our terms. What does it mean to mourn? <coughs> Excuse me. Or to grieve. Well, to mourn means to grieve a loss. We mentioned one, to, to, to grieve the loss of a loved one. Um, somebody that you love very much dies. Or, or it can even be grieving the loss of a relationship. Oftentimes, um, most of the time, when people go through a divorce or, or when actually when even children launch into the world, there's a change in that relationship. And there's a, a period of mourning, a period of grieving that things have changed. Children move on. They, they get their own lives. They don't call as much. They don't show up as much. And there's a, a grieving process in that. You can also mourn the loss of a position, uh, whether that be uh, your work job, sudden, suddenly you're unemployed. Um, it could be a position of health. Um, you, know, you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you're not doing nearly as well as you thought you were. Or you come to that realization at your, uh, on your own that you, know, you are no longer 18 years old and capable of doing things that 18-year-olds can do. Um, and it could be the loss of a dream, the loss of a vision. Things just didn't work out the way you, you had planned them. And, and so there's a sense of mourning, a, a grieving of that loss. It's going to hit every single one of us. And many people who are watching this are grieving as they're listening to this. Why don't we talk about this a little bit more? I think there's a reason for that. And I think the reason is, is that loss reminds us of sin. And sin is not something that we like to spend a lot of time talking about. 
certainly not a lot, something that we want to spend a lot of time thinking about. Loss reminds us of consequences of sin. Here's something that maybe you hadn't thought of before. In the Garden of Eden, there was no loss. It didn't happen. No animal died. Nothing broke. Um, Adam and Eve had each other. They were in a perfect relationship with each other. They were in a perfect relationship with God. God the Father didn't walk down on the, in the garden one day and gather Adam and Eve together and say, you know what, oh, this is a little awkward, but, you know, the Son and the Spirit when I got to talking yesterday over supper and, ah, like I said, awkwardness, but I really kind of think we're thinking about taking the universe in a little bit different direction. Um, so, sorry, but... We're not going to continue this notion of you humans being made in the image of us. We're going to have to let you go. Our new vision takes us in the line of the hippopotamuses being the ones who are now made in our image. Um, so good luck in finding another position. Have a great day. Uh, keep in touch. Ta-ta. See you later. That conversation never happened. Never happened. They were in a perfect relationship with God, perfect relationship with each other, a perfect relationship with their environment. They didn't even mourn the loss of youth. They got up the next day looking and feeling just like they did the day before. They got up and they never got up with a cold or, a, or the flu. They never got up with anything wrong with them. Everything was always okay. And I think God created us to live in that environment so that when we sinned, when Adam and Eve took a bite out of whatever that fruit was, and they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, it's not like God said, okay, we're going to kick them out of the Garden, but let's get in here and rewire their brain so that they can deal with being mortal. No, we were never rewired for that. So every time we experience loss, we experience something that we weren't wired for. We experience something that we were not built to handle because sin was never part of the original equation. And I think that's one of the reasons why we don't talk about it. It's because we don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to handle it. You know, you can cry yourself silly for days and days and days, and it doesn't change the reality that the loss has happened. You can pretend that people are there. It doesn't change the fact that they're not. You can just refuse to take the medications to pretend that you don't, you're not as sick as the doctor says you are. It's not going to change anything. See, we're not wired for this. I'm oftentimes asked when it comes to death, what is the better way to go? Is it better to, to get a disease and just slowly die over a predictable period of time? Or is it better to die instantly and, and, and surprise everybody? And the answer is neither. The, the reality is no one is wired for this. I have watched both. And both are profoundly disturbing to the soul, even to people who are not even connected to the people. We, we hear stories on the news of, of this person dying or this person being shot or, or this person dying of, of natural causes. And even then, even if we don't know the guy, there's a part of us that goes, Ugh, that's not okay. Ugh, what do I do with that? Well, it's a sign of mourning. And mourning is a sign that we don't know what to do with the loss that we're experiencing. Now, I think one of the things that's really important to understand, and not only in our day, but in Jesus's day too, is that most of the time we mourn because of pervasive sin, not personal sin. Now, there, there are times in which we mourn personal sin. 
we do something clearly that is is against God's will, that is is not the smart thing to do, and we end up with consequences that bring about loss. We can tie those those things together very clearly. I did this. This is what resulted. This is how this is how I got to loss with that. That's loss because of personal sin. But vast majority of the things that we mourn about are because of pervasive sin. We can't look at somebody who died of cancer and say, oh, I know why you died of cancer. It's because you didn't love God. It's because you didn't trust God enough. It's because your family didn't trust God enough. It's because you didn't tithe enough to the church. It's because you didn't serve uh, as many years as God intended on the deacon board or the, the deaconesses board or something like that. No, 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 no. Most of the time we mourn because of pervasive sin. We mourn because of sin that has affected the whole world, and as a result of that, we experience loss. Maybe we participated in the consequence of that. Most of the time it's not because of sin that we did specifically, but because of a larger broad. And that's really important to, to grasp because that's not what the rabbis were teaching in Jesus' day. And oftentimes that's not the message that people who are mourning receive today. Today's passage, though, speaks volumes, volumes to those of us who are mourning. It says, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In that one sentence, Jesus packs a wallop of a sermon. And it starts out with a very interesting statement. Something that the, that the rabbis in Jesus' day would have, would have choked out loud with, would have just gasped for air. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. Let me ask you a question here. Can you point to one place in the Bible, just one place in the Bible where God blessed sin. Now, he blesses sinners all the time, yes, but God blesses sin. Somebody goes out and does exactly the opposite of what God wanted them to do, and God said, yep, that was that one made me so mad, I'm going to give you a million dollars. Yep, you, you really torqued me off badly there. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom. That's what I'm going to do. Is there any place in the scripture where God blesses sin? And the answer is no. He doesn't bless sin. He can forgive sin, but he doesn't bless sin. And this is why this is so important to this statement. Jesus says in his opening line here with this verse, Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. If mourning is a sin, if, if grieving is a sin, then why is God blessing it? Well, wait a minute. Who, who said that grieving or, or mourning is a sin? Uh, I'm sorry. But there's a lot of people out there that quietly hold in the back of their head that mourning or that grieving is a sin. And it was very much true in Jesus' day as well. Remember the disciples, they're walking down this, this road and they see this guy sitting here on the side of the road. He's, a, he's an invalid, he can't get around. Um, and they asked Jesus this question right in front of the guy too. This, this I always found slightly irritating. Who, who sin caused this guy's bad luck, if you will? Was it him or was it his parents? That is so much of the teaching of the rabbis of that day. Jesus punishes with loss. And not Jesus, sorry. God punishes with loss. That was the teaching in Jesus' day that was pervasive. 
if you're doing well, if you've got lots of money in the bank, if your grandparents are still alive and your great grandparents are still alive and, and everybody's okay and nobody's sick, that's a sign that you're living the life the way God wants you to and everything's okay. But if anything goes wrong in your life, that's a sign not only to you but everybody else watching that you have blown it somehow. So don't, don't get sad about that. Don't get upset. Fix it. Change it so that you could go back to being blessed. That was a teaching in Jesus' day. That's the same teaching that we hear oftentimes in our world today. A lot of people call it the health and wealth gospel. I call it the health and wealth heresy. The idea is that if you do what God wants you to do, God has no choice but to bless your socks off, to give you everything you want, everything you need, and minimize your losses to the bare minimum. You will not experience loss if you follow Jesus Christ. He will make every day happier than the day before. Lie, 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 lie. And this is a, a wonderful place to take people who are holding to that notion. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. He doesn't say mourning is a sign that you've blown it. He says blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. You ever get the impression from somebody when you're in a, in a season of mourning, of deep mourning, that it's time to get over it? That it's time to let go of it? Or it's time to figure out what you're doing wrong so that it doesn't bother you anymore? I'm sorry. Those are all lies. That's shame and guilt that Satan pours on us and that others pour on us as well because they want us to be done with it. And the truth of the matter is, again, you're not wired for loss. You lose somebody important to you, you're going to feel that for the rest of your life. And that's okay. That's not sin. That's not a lack of faith. That's because you and I are wired to not have to deal with loss. We aren't prepared for this. I was in Walmart a couple of weeks ago. And I'm walking down one of the aisles. And, and I'm reaching for this box of cereal or something that, that uh, I was supposed to buy. And I was just overcome with a sense of grief. And I couldn't figure out why. I'm like picking this bag of chips up and the tears are forming in my eyes. And, and I'm, I'm you know, kind of choked breathing at the same time. <laughs> why on earth am I grieving? Why on earth am I sad right now? And I stop and I think about it. What I smelled in that moment was my grandmother's perfume, Avon. I smelled Avon perfume. It was probably from some woman that walked right by. And it brought back a flood of grandma memories. And I was sad. I was grieving for my grandmother. My grandmother passed away over 40 years ago. We don't get over it, and that's okay. It's not a lack of faith. It's not a lack of, um, it's not an act of selfishness. Mourning is saying sin is bad, and the consequences of sin is bad, and the consequences hurt, and that's all okay. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, here's a really important piece to this puzzle. Those who mourn, Jesus says, will be comforted. It doesn't say, blessed are those who mourn, for if they think about it and they read the right books and they get involved in the right groups and they just keep themselves busy, they'll get over it. It doesn't say that. It says, blessed are those who mourn, 
for they will be comforted. As much as I would like to try to do this, there is no way I can comfort myself. I've got a blanket that I love that's nice and warm and fuzzy, and I, I curl up in that sometimes. That sounds really manly, doesn't it? But I do. Um, I, you know, I've got comfort foods that I go to. You know, when, when I was done uh, kind of remembering Grandma and, 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 and loving those moments and feeling sad that she wasn't here, I immediately went to the cookie aisle and bought the kind of cookies that my grandmother always gave me every time I showed up at her house. Um, I went home and I ate pretty much the whole package just in celebration of her life and, 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 and allowing myself to mourn that. Um, blessed are the... And, and so on that level, yes, I guess I kind of comforted myself, but really comfort has to come from outside, especially the word that Jesus uses here for comfort. The word that Jesus uses for comfort has two meanings to it. It means, first of all, to console. And secondly, it means to draw close. How about your, your parents? When I fell down and skinned my knee and I grieved the loss of that skin on that knee and I saw blood and I was terrified because I thought I was going to die because I skinned my knee, what did I do? I, I, I hope I did what most people do when you're knee high to a grasshopper. I started crying started crying really loudly and I started run towards the front door of the house and I get into the house and I mom I skinned my knee and it hurts like the leg is going to fall off right and what did mom do come here son I go over to her and she look at it and she oh yeah oh mm, yeah mm, oh yeah that, that's a good one. That one might leave a mark there, kiddo. Mm -hmm. Let's go take care of it. And so we, we go together to the bathroom, to the medicine closet. And she'd pull out a cotton ball and some kind of cleaning stuff. And she'd gently clean it. And then, and then she'd put some ointment on it. And then she'd put a Band-Aid on it. If we were lucky that particular month, we got the special Band-Aids with, with Superman or Spider-Man or something on it. And she'd put that Band-Aid on. And then you know what she'd do? She'd give it a kiss. And then she'd give me a great big hug. And she'd say, you're all better now. Go out and play. That's a beautiful picture of the word comfort that Jesus uses. Not only to console, not only to take care of the boo-boo and, and to give it a kiss, but to draw close, to hug, to hold Blessed are those who are grieving losses. For God might comfort you. Nope, that's not what it says. For God hopes to comfort you. Nope, that's not what it says either. For you will, for they will be comforted. Do you hear the promise in that? They will be comforted. Now, again, it doesn't say that God will fix it. Loss cannot be fixed. When the loss occurs, the loss happens. It's never going to be made right again. You cannot bring people that you love back to the dinner table. Even if you get the job back that you lost, it's not going to be the same. But blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus said it a little bit differently in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you realize that God wants to comfort you? In the midst of your loss. Even losses that happened 40, 50 years ago, God is still wanting to be there with you in those moments and with those feelings. Now, here's another thing that Satan loves to play, and that is the consequence game or the if-only-itis game. You know what I mean? 
a loved one passes away and there's that sense of grief and loss and we start thinking stinking thinking things like you know if only we had gotten a second opinion or a third opinion or or a 457th opinion if only we had tried that that alternative medicine if only we hadn't done the alternative medicine kind of a thing if only um, we had taken this more seriously if only we had taken this less seriously if only if only if only if only I would have worked harder at work I, I wouldn't have been the one that they let go. If only I wouldn't have worked so hard in life, this divorce might not have happened. All of those if onlys. We do that to try to gain some power over the situation so that we can, you know, somehow control it. And the truth of the matter is, loss happens and we're not going to control it. It's never going to be controlled. And whether or not that consequence, that sense of mourning and that sense of loss comes about because of personal sin or pervasive sin, it doesn't change God's promises here. He doesn't say, blessed are those who mourn and don't deserve to mourn, for they will be comforted. It doesn't say, blessed are those who mourn that didn't act stupidly, for I will comfort them. This is a blanket statement. Jesus says there in Matthew 11, it doesn't say, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden because you're working so hard for me and you've never made a mistake in your life. No. If you are weary, if you are heavy laden, if you are grieving a sense of loss, and I don't care how long it's been, understand God is there for you. And he intends to console you, to draw you close, and to hold you for the rest of your existence regarding that loss. And that's where the blessing comes. Yeah, we mourn things, we grieve things because we're not wired for loss. But in a very real sense, God fills that gap for those who let him fill that gap. David, someday to become king, finds himself in a cave. He's hiding from King Saul, who has made every effort that he can muster to kill David. In a very real sense, David is mourning. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that his biggest concern was where is sheep number four? That was it. Played his harp, kept kept track of sheep, went home when it was time to go home, probably got a noodle rub from his older brothers every once in a while, and that was it. That That was the long and the short of it. Life was good and quiet and and not messy. And now here's David hiding in a cave, being hunted. In a very real sense, he's grieving the loss of innocence. Grieving the loss of his own freedom. Listen to the words that he writes specifically to be sung in the temple to those who might understand how he's feeling and appreciate words of encouragement of, I've been there. Psalm 142. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. Before him, I tell all my troubles. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you that knows my way. In the path where I walk, men have hidden a snare for me. Look to my right and see, no one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life, so it seems. I cry to you, O Lord. I say you are my refuge. You are my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, 
for I am desperate in need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set free, for, set me free from my prison, that I may dwell, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of the goodness you have shown me. David, a man after God's own heart, grieved. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to hurt. Don't let Hollywood tell you that you have to be over it by the next commercial break. Don't let people tell you that you got six months and then it's time to presume that everything is back to normal. There will be no normal as you knew it. Grieve. Cry. And don't let Satan tell you that it's somehow a lack of faith or selfishness. It's okay. Now, there is a point where grieving can become overwhelming. And with that, this is why God created the church. This is why God created people to be able to be there for you, to hold you up in times of need like you've held up others in times of their need. So don't let it dominate your life, but don't hide from it either. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And if you're not in a current state of mourning, you do know somebody who is. Don't try to gloss it over. Don't try to change the subject. Don't pretend that their loss isn't there. Join them in their loss. Be there for them. Listen to their stories. And remember that when you're in the presence of somebody who's mourning, as awkward as that might feel, as sad as that might feel, if Jesus speaks the truth here, which I have no reason to doubt, when you're in the presence of somebody who is mourning, you are in the presence of somebody that God wants to bless. Don't get in God's And at the same time, you could be God's hands and feet, voice and heart to be the blessing that they need. Have a great week. Catch you next week, I hope.